Are we sitting comfortably? Yes, thank you. Then we'll begin. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the lunch. Welcome back to our 25th anniversary symposium. <clears throat> in this afternoon's session, we're going to be showcasing the BC Vision Zero in Road Safety Grant Program. This is a program that is a collaboration between the BC Ministries of Health and Transportation and Infrastructure, the First Nations Health Authority, the five regional health authorities, and the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit. With generous funding from the BC Ministries of Health and Transportation and Infrastructure, since its inception in 2021, the program has awarded already over a million dollars to communities throughout British Columbia to implement novel projects that makes their roads safer to travel on, particularly for pedestrian cyclists and other vulnerable road users. This grant program exemplifies the province's commitment to the goal of zero fatalities or serious injuries on the road. And as we heard earlier on this morning, represents one of the most innovative and leading developments in road safety in this country in terms of community investment. So I think once again, congratulations to our government and to the ministries of health and infra transport and infrastructure for uh, leading the way and being first out there and not being afraid to do so. It's now my pleasure then to invite Ms. Andrea Godfreyson and Ms. Kate Berniaz, two key individuals who've both played an instrumental role in the work of developing and implementing the Vision Zero Grant program. They're going to speak now a little more about the program and then the, pro and then the afternoon presentations will continue. So Andrea. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here. I'm here in person, and then you can see my lovely colleague, Kate Berniaz, is larger than life there on the screen. And so I'll be presenting- You didn't need to say that, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> Just on personality alone. And so I'll be presenting here um, the majority of the presentation, and then Kate will uh, have the privilege of presenting about the benefits of the program towards the end. Uh, so just before we get started, just um, introduce myself again. I'm Andrea Godfreyson, Director of Injury and Clinical Prevention with the BC Ministry of Health. We're within Population Public Health um, under the supervision of Doc, uh, Jonathan Robinson, who you met earlier this morning. And uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Kate to say hello. Thank you. Andrea, and thank you for inviting us to speak today on, on Vision Zero. I'm Kate Berniaz. I'm the Director of Climate and Active Transportation with the Ministry of Transportation and, uh, and Infrastructure, and congratulations on your, your silver anniversary. Thanks. Great, thank you. You already see us there. Okay, and so before we get started, just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge with gratitude that I have the privilege to work on the unceded traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, and I'm an uninvited white settler there. Uh, so certainly with this work and all the rest of the work we do within the public service, really own that commitment that we have to truth and reconciliation and considering how we can further that uh, within our work overall, as well as this program itself. Uh, so that's a very important foundational piece that we bring with us every day. So I'll just start by setting a bit of context. We heard a lot of statistics this morning. Uh, here we're drilling down into motor vehicle crashes. So thinking about the road safety as one of the many ways someone can be injured. And we know that every year in BC, 87,000 people are injured through motor vehicle crashes and around 300 people lose their lives. So that's 300 people with families, communities, um, workplaces that are all grieving the loss of loved ones 
and have are left with that legacy for years to come. We also know that Indigenous people are disproportionately impacted uh, by injury in general, and that includes motor vehicle crashes. Uh, so our work is paramount in this space. On this slide, you can see uh, a lot of boxes, uh, but perhaps what you want to focus in on is these are the leading causes of injury hospitalization. So not surprisingly, with all those crashes, people go to hospital. Um, this is categorized by different types of injuries here. And what you can see in orange is that transport related injuries show up as the second highest uh, cause of injury hospitalization for almost all the age groups. Uh, so you can see that's what's generating emergency department visits and acute care bed spaces. And not surprisingly, then again, we talk about cost. I know that cost was mentioned a bit this morning. Um, first and foremost, it's about the human lives lost and the tragedy associated with that and trying to prevent uh, those preventable years of life lost. Uh, when we look at the cost, it helps put into context what we're talking about here. And transport related incidents show up at $492 million per year. That's five years ago. So perhaps it's different now. Um, but it is a very, very expensive proposition. I think what was said this morning is really, really important to restate here about the predictability of injury. So it's both a good news and a bad news story. Uh, we know that injuries are predictable and we know that about 90% of them are preventable. Uh, so the bad news is they're still happening and we haven't stopped it. The good news is we still can move forward doing better. And so that's really where Vision Zero comes in. I think many of people in the room probably know what Vision Zero is, um, but what it is, is it's a philosophy and it's a philosophy that guides a global road safety movement. And really it's founded on the principle that no loss of life is acceptable. So not one single individual losing their life is okay. And the goal for Vision Zero is to eliminate serious injuries and lives lost on the road. It was implemented in Sweden in the late 1990s and has made substantive difference uh, in Sweden and other countries ever since its implementation. And it really starts with the belief that everyone has a right to move around their community safely. So whether you're on foot, on a bike, on a scooter, in a wheelchair, uh, you have, should have the right to move safely around your community. And we all share in the responsibility to make that happen. So whether you're a policymaker like myself, a uh, road designer, uh, like my colleagues at Moti, you might be a road user like many of us today to get here. We all share in that responsibility. And so what Vision Zero tells us is that people make mistakes. I make mistakes driving. Uh, I didn't drive here, luckily, but uh, I make mistakes all the time. And so what we need is a system that actually takes that into account and puts the necessary uh, structures in place. So when those mistakes inevitably happen, the severity of the outcome is less. So that's really the point of this. <laughs> and Vision Zero uses a safe systems approach. So that's how it happens. Uh, this is really how we can dramatically improve road safety. And it's an integrated comprehensive process that recognizes that fallibility and vulnerability that people have. And so the principles are really simple. Like I mentioned, humans make mistakes. We're vulnerable to injury. So when a crash happens, uh, we get injured and the responsibility is shared. As well, there's no amount of lives lost that are acceptable. And we need to be proactive, not reactive to this work. And then also the fact that overlapping measures are crucial. So we need to build that scaffolding in, put in the redundancy so that when mistakes happen, the outcome isn't severe. So Vision Zero in BC, this has been adopted as what's guiding road safety in our province. So the road safety strategy 2025, uh, that's by our colleagues at the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and the Ministry of Public Safety Solicitor General, 
Uh, their strategy indicates that Vision Zero guides BC's approach. It's been adopted internationally, different places in Canada, uh, different cities in BC, and with us here today. Um, it is a proactive preventive approach that prioritizes public health and road safety. So to me, that's a really fundamental piece of the puzzle. And a really important part of this as well is understanding who's getting injured. So who are the people on the road uh, they are getting hurt the most? And people outside of motor vehicles, they don't have that protective shell around them as you would if you're in a car or a truck or an SUV. They don't have windshields, seat belts, airbags, any of those things. So when people, vulnerable road users, people on their feet, people cycling, people on scooters, uh, people on skateboards, get hit, the, the outcome, outcome is much, is much more, more catastrophic than it, than it might otherwise be if you were in a vehicle. And the statistics show us that's true. So one in five people killed in motor vehicle crashes in BC are pedestrians. And this graph shows a comparison between the hospitalization incidents for people, whether you're in a motor vehicle versus on a bike or walking. And what you can see here is, is somewhat of a good news story where the hospitalization rate for people in vehicles has actually gone down quite well. I'm told that the trend is actually coming back up in a U shape. Um, however, there have been some gains there in terms of safety. But what we're not seeing are gains for the safety of people who are cycling or walking. And so that's really important for us to pay attention to because we haven't made much of a difference in that space. And that's why vulnerable road users, protecting them from transport related injuries is one of our three provincial injury prevention priorities that many of us are all collaborating to work towards. And it brings us to this program. So I am so privileged to talk about this program to such an esteemed audience today. And I feel a bit humbled to be honest as I deserve zero credit for this program overall. Uh, it started far before me, um, but I'll speak about it today and hopefully others can be congratulated this afternoon on the work that's happened across all of the different agencies, health authorities and communities. Um, but what this program is, is a way that the province is supporting Vision Zero and that safe systems approach uh, across communities in our beautiful province of BC. So this program rather provides small grants, grants up to $20,000 uh, per project to communities for low cost road safety improvements. Um, so that could be to a local government, an indigenous government, indigenous community, or a non-governmental organization. It could be a parental advisory council, a charitable organization, it could be a school district. Uh, lots of different types of organizations can apply. And there are two specific streams to this program. So stream one is for the design and installation of low cost road infrastructure primarily, um, could be temporary or permanent, um, but it also funds other evidence-based approaches as well as some innovative initiatives as well. And stream two is dedicated to provide Indigenous communities and governments the opportunity to set and direct their own priorities around road safety. So it could be infrastructure improvements, but it could be something different as well. It could be community engagement, it could be road safety planning, uh, it could be any sort of initiative that the community feels will improve road safety. Uh, funding for this program is shared. So I'm pleased that the Ministry of Health uh, sees this as a priority and provides funding for it. Uh, it's co-funded with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, so my colleague Kate and others, and also the regional health authorities provide funding for this program. So it's been amazing to see the amount of funding that was provided, especially last year, by regional health authorities to top up the funding provided by government and really optimize the amount of projects that can happen in communities. And that made a significant difference in the amount of funding overall. And just briefly, in terms of delivery, uh, this doesn't showcase the work that goes into the program or the different roles that 
people hold, um, but perhaps it just provides a 30,000 foot view of what people are um, doing in their role. So the government, um, Ministry of Health leading it, uh, we are co-funding it with MOTI. The Injury Research Prevention Unit, we've heard loud and clear about the amazing leadership and expertise, and they provide program administration. So they are the hub for this program, allowing this program to operate. They manage the website, which is amazing if you've seen it. Uh, they've got the online grant portal that allows for adjudication, support the adjudication process, reporting, and they're about developing out an evaluation framework and a toolkit for communities. So a ton of work happening by the unit on this program, and it should really be a cause for celebration. And the regional health authorities in BCCDC are critical, obviously, to this as well. Uh, so each of the injury prevention leads across each health authority is the champion and lead for this program. So they are the ones doing the work of implementing it within their region. They support communities from application phase all the way through to um, implementing their projects and reporting out on them. They lead adjudication and they also provide funding. So all kinds of work goes into that and hopefully we'll learn about the outcomes this afternoon. Uh, just briefly in terms of reach, uh, we're only in year two of the program in terms of projects. Uh, we have seen growth, which is good. Uh, the first year uh, we have 37 projects that were funded and those were finished uh, at the end of March. And now we're in the second year where there's been 67 projects funded at over a million dollars of investment for those grants. Uh, so really glad to see that uh, increase in growth and pleased to announce that on Monday, the next grant will be opening up. So that will be our year three of the program and applications will be open until mid-January. And I will take the opportunity now to hand it over to Kate to talk about benefits. Great, thank you, Andrea. Yeah, all that work that um, was, was discussed around Vision Zero, the Ministry of Transportation has, as you saw, uh, is a co-signatory to the road safety strategy. But we also have a specific interest in seeing an increase in active transportation use on our roads or on in our communities. And we know that safety and perception of safety has a huge impact on whether people choose to walk or cycle to their um, destinations. And so we see a huge opportunity with building safer streets to encourage more active transportation use. And that's done using Vision Zero principles and installing infrastructure like separated, separating road users or significantly reducing speeds on our roads. Next slide, please. There. Um, and with that, more active transportation also helps meet our climate goals. We are working with the, with the Climate Action Secretariat and the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030 that has ambitious goals on reducing uh, specifically transportation emissions, but emissions across our, our sectors. And with transportation being such a huge contributor to our provincial GHG emissions, we really need to find ways to have people move out of personal cars to walking and cycling at transit and, and reduce those transportation emissions in, um, in that sector. In 2019, when I joined the ministry, we had released the Move Commute Connect, the provincial the province's first active transportation strategy. And part of that uh, strategy was the goal to double the percentage of tri trips taken by active transportation by 2030. And we see, next slide please, that if we have an investment in active transportation, as we see that, that we, can, we can entice, we can encourage more people to walk and cycle, um, that that will lead to both increasing active transportation mode share and lowering GHG emissions. And just by switching one trip a day, we can save tremendous amounts of, of, of GHG emissions um, by having people choose those short trips, those easy to, to walk or cycle, taking your kids to school, those kinds of trips can have a huge impact on GHG emission reductions. Next slide, please. As well, 
our interest with shared with uh, the Ministry of Health is on meeting those health goals. So it's not only having road safety um, and reducing um, reducing injuries. It's also about increasing physical activity and those the health impacts on that. And as as you in the audience know, physical activity has numerous individual health benefits from physical health, chronic disease to mental health. And as well with active transportation and walking and cycling, there's also a huge community and social uh, ben health benefit in terms of getting people connected and seeing your neighbors and, and making those, those connections on our streets. Because physical inactivity costs BC approximately a billion dollars annually in direct and indirect costs. And those can be reduced if we have safer roads where more people are walking and cycling. Next slide, please. So overall, the province is committed to Vision Zero and the Vision Zero and Road Safety uh, Grant Program is one of the many ways we're working together to uh, re reduce and eliminate serious injury and death on our roads. And we want to support healthier communities where people feel safe walking and cycling so that regardless of the, the mode they choose to get to their destination, they can do that safely to get that physical activity that that prevents uh, chronic disease and other health issues while reducing carbon emissions to meet our clean BC targets. And finally, reducing that healthcare system uh, burden when, when we have, as Andrea spoke to, injuries that are, are very preventable. So we want to talk, say that this is just the start, the road safety uh, grant program is is a great start to show what we can do when we work together with the health authorities working within their communities and building those strong relationships um, and starting those conversations on road safety in every corner of the province. Um, and the, that Vision Zero has really helped strengthen, strengthen those relationships. Um, but one with beyond going with beyond these small grants, it's really ha showing how when we work together, we can get a lot of, um, a, have a lot of impact and, and make a big difference in, in road safety across the province. Thank you so much and thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Megan Oki to come because she's going to MC this afternoon's session. Megan is the Injury Prevention Manager for BCCDC and PHSA and a member of the BC Injury Research and Prevention Team. So, Megan. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ian. Um, and very quickly, I actually wanted to offer my own congratulations um, on a tremendous 25 years. So the BCRPU, of which I've been so fortunate to be a part of for the last eight, um, and offer um, my gratitude for the mentorship um, and the support to not just myself, but my new team and to all the health authorities and all of our partners over the, over the last few years, it's just been tremendous. And I can't wait for the years to come. Um, so we've got um, a series of presentations coming up now on the Vision Zero Grants. This is such an exciting program. Um, so we'll move from East to West. Um, we'll start off with presentations from the interior and the North and then Fraser Health, and after the break, we'll um, hear from Island Health and Vancouver Coastal Health. So it's my pleasure to welcome our first presenter from the interior, Mike Adams, the team lead for Healthy Communities, and he will speak to road safety in his region and welcome Joanne Doddridge, who was one of the recipients of the Vision Zero grants in its inaugural year. Okay, so I need to, it's none. Thank you. 
Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to be providing an overview on our Vision Interior Health Vision Zero Grant Program. I want to congratulate the BCIRPU on 25 years of injury prevention advocacy, knowledge, and practice. I also want to thank Megan Clammer, our former injury prevention lead, as well as Christine Hollander with our GIS department for their help in putting this presentation together. I would like to recognize that the communities we engage in injury prevention services with are situated on eight traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Dekel Dene, Tanaha, Inklaklatma, Shwepm, Sinaix, Statlium, Silks, and Chilcotin nations where we live, learn, collaborate, and work together. Today, I join you from the converging territories of the Tanaha, Sinaix, and Silk nations in a community briefly known in time as Trail. 2022 was our first year administering the Vision Zero Grant Program. From our perspective, it was quite successful. We received $100,000 in provincial funding and supported five communities who received $20,000 each towards their projects. We received applications from Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities and saw geographical representation by communities from across our region. We also observed a variety of road safety interventions and measures being implemented. Lots of good learning occurred in year one and the grant program spurred research. We made new community connections, developed new relationships, as well as new interagency collaboration. One example was it became quite evident during the grant application review process that the adjudication panel members independently applied a strong equity lens when considering all the project proposals. Another example was consideration of proposals that were unique and distinct. Sideldale First Nation is a community divided by Highway 20 and there had been several deaths occur at the intersection pictured. The community knew they wanted to do something to improve road safety at this crossroad. Their vision was to work through a collaborative planning and engagement process involving community members and partner agencies to identify the most appropriate intervention or interventions for their local context. We also heard from one of our communities that the grant would allow them to kickstart their community's active transportation plan as well as safety efforts along one of the most frequently traveled roadways. This year, we had more grant funding available and we received more community applications, 21 in total. We also made improvement to our processes by applying the learnings from year one. Again, it has been another successful year. We received $120,000 in provincial funding, which Interior Health was able to match. 13 communities received road safety grants ranging from $3,500 to $20,000. And again, there was geographical representation by communities from across our region. We had quite a diverse group of applicants and project proposals. Again, we're seeing a variety of Vision Zero interventions and measures being implemented in the communities unique to their needs and context. We also enhanced our adjudication panel with broader representation and by including additional technical expertise. In summary, after two years of administering our Vision Zero grant program, we have allocated $340,000 in funding to support 18 community road safety projects. Our appreciation to all participating communities. And now to showcase one of our Vision Zero communities. 100 Mile House is one of our smaller progressive communities within the Caribou. They have successfully applied to the grant program in both years, which has allowed them to implement as well as expand their road safety initiative. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Joanne Doddridge, the Director of Economic Development and Planning with the District of 100 Mile House. Joanne will be presenting her community's Vision Zero story. To me, 
It is an example of their local government demonstrating its values by listening to the community, staying nimble and flexible during the course of the project, and taking the opportunity to provide additional impact and value to, the, uh, to lower the injury risk for residents and vulnerable road, road users. Joanne, over to you. Thank you. Hi there, can you hear me? Okay, I think I'm going to share my screen, which I haven't done before. You would think after two years or three years of doing these virtual meetings that we would have done a little bit of everything by now, but uh, this is my first, first try. I think I see some screen sharing going on there from the beginning. Okay, how does that look? Great, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for that, Mike. Uh, we are really happy to be able to participate in this Vision Zero uh, road safety project. So I thought I would start by just showing you our little community and letting you folks know that our population here in 100 Mile in the South Caribou is very small. We have uh, 2,000 or so residents, but we service an area that's much larger, approximately 15,000 people year round and much larger in the summertime. And so because of that larger service area, uh, we provide a lot of different services to the outlying community, including recreation services. And one of those services is our, our soccer fields. Um, our soccer fields um, are situated in a very older established neighborhood, a residential neighborhood. It's at the very end of a, of a street of, of homes. And there are two residential roads that um, are used to access the soccer fields. So our problem began, well, many years ago when we started receiving complaints uh, from those residents about speeding in that neighborhood. And we just felt that it was time to really work on a solution. Um, and create a safer passage for the families and the families that live in those neighborhoods, but also the families that travel to the soccer fields and for those kids and other family members that want to bicycle there or, or walk to the soccer field. So try this advancing, yeah. So we identified a need to really reduce the traffic. It's not a speedway. That photo maybe kind of looks like a wide street, but it's a very small, uh, sleepy two-way street in our community. And we wanted to install speed bumps on the two roads uh, accessing the soccer fields. So we applied to the Vision Zero um, community grant and were successful in, in, in um, receiving some grant funding. And so we, we're really looking at these streets, which, which have a posted speed limit of 30 kilometers an hour. Um, and how would we best protect the, the road users, all of the road users in the area, and all of those families that are trying to back in and out of their driveways uh, with all these speeding moms and dads getting to soccer, uh, and to soccer practice. So there are no sidewalks in that neighborhood. You can see in the photo, um, it's an older neighborhood and there's not much room for us to build sidewalks to create that level of protection for you know, pedestrians. Uh, so we decided uh, the, you know, the speed bump avenue would be the best approach for us. To get a sense of those traffic volumes, we, we did some estimating and we had, we historically had up to 700 people registered to play soccer, but in recent years, it's been around 300, um, 300 kids going to soccer uh, twice a week. So that's 600 trips uh, to and from 
times twice a week. That's, you know, a lot of traffic, 1,200 plus uh, vehicles every week traveling through these small residential neighborhoods. Um, so uh, at the peak of registration, we could see those numbers be up to 3,000. And so in a, you know, a big center with a huge arterial, you know, road system, that might be able to be handled, but in our, our sleepy little residential neighborhood, that was just not tenable. So uh, we, we identified these high rates of speed just before and just after soccer games. And we kind of urgently wanted to calm that, calm that activity. And uh, last year that really came to the fore. Uh, our complaints uh, here at the district office uh, were quite a bit higher than they had been, and residents were expressing concerns uh, for their safety in their own in their own neighborhoods. So we were also concerned with uh, pedestrian safety because it is a residential neighborhood where the kids can walk to their soccer field, and um, it was just it was just un, an unfriendly environment for them to do that. So our main goal was to create a safer passage, of course, for all street users and all area residents, but we also wanted to support uh, sort of physical activity and allow people in the community, which, which is really walkable otherwise, uh, to be able to walk or bicycle to their, to their event. Um, we wanted to reduce noise uh, because the, the traffic in the neighborhood does create a lot of noise to improve you know, recreational opportunities um, and to improve the neighborhood overall, just in terms of enjoying you know, people's peace and quiet of their yards. Uh, but overall road uh, and pedestrian safety were paramount. So our project consisted of the installation of two speed bumps. Uh, they don't look like much, but they are very effective. Uh, two speed bumps on North Birch Avenue and two speed bumps on Evergreen Crescent. And so the white arrows are, are painted on there. And um, the timing for us, we needed to install two of the speed bumps on North Birch Ave first, and then our paving crew had to leave town. Uh, so we had a few weeks delay before the second set of two speed bumps were installed. And we learned a couple of things from that. Uh, so immediately after the North Birch speed bumps were installed, but before the other ones, we all of a sudden heard from residents that people were avoiding North Birch Avenue in favor of zipping up Evergreen that didn't have speed bumps yet. And so right off the bat, we saw changes in behavior of the drivers and they wanted the fastest possible route and they, they found it. Complaint levels dropped immediately after the two speed bumps were installed and, um, and they dropped dramatically, the complaint levels. Um, once the Evergreen Crescent speed bumps a few weeks later were installed, there was a real noticeable reduction in the speed and the noise in the neighborhood. And that alone had a huge um, positive impact in our community. The other surprising thing that happened, well, maybe not surprising uh, thing that happened was all of a sudden our phones began to ring that other neighborhoods, other residents in other neighborhoods wanted to know when they would get speed bumps in their neighborhood. So it really was sort of taking off. Um, our public works team that looked after, you know, the installation was able to sort of tie this project in with some other paving work that was being done in town. And so we, we came in really significantly under budget on these two sets of speed bumps. So we approached the Vision Zero folks, our, our friends at Interior Health, and, um, and requested a couple of more speed bumps in another neighborhood that had some daycare centers. But also we wanted to buy a speed board because our initial sort of speed projections were just estimates and we really wanted a way to quantify how fast people really were going and how much how effective these uh, road calming measures were. And uh, so fortunately we were able to sort of reallocate some of those funds to do that, to purchase um, this mobile speed board and we are starting to use that 
Um, I'll explain a little bit of, about that in a minute. Um, but basically in phase two of the project, which I, I guess would be the second phase, we, we went to a different neighborhood and we set up our speed board and started clocking how fast people were traveling in our 30K zone. And this other neighborhood is, is still a family residential neighborhood, but there's a lot of seniors in this, this, this secondary neighborhood called Caribou Trail. And we have worked really hard over the last few years to do multiple improvements to Caribou Trail to improve that area for these vulnerable road users um, to, to, you know, so we, we built a new sidewalk up the entire length of Caribou Trail. You can just see it in the photo there on the right. Uh, pedestrian lighting was installed all along there. And uh, we, we, we built in some traffic calming bulbs and which I'm not sure that's what they're called, but, um, and then some signage. So those were improvements we had already done, but we still needed to reduce the speeds along there even further. And so we, we started tracking the data from this new speed board and saw how fast you know, people were driving and noted the peak times that, that uh, we saw vehicle movements and, and speeding. And then we were successful in installing a few more speed bumps along this road and then began tracking uh, the speeds afterwards. And so um, we, we did notice some huge outcomes right off the bat, including a 10% decrease in speeding on this road alone. And at first, you know, I thought 10% wasn't you know, all that much to rave about. 10% was really great because that brings the average speeds down to about what the posted speed limit is. So together with all of the other sort of safety improvements that have been made on that street, this these speed bumps have made a big difference. I think the other the other thing that that this has done is uh, these speed boards, you know, they they definitely, you know, are a reminder to drivers to reduce their speeds. And I think maybe it's human nature to, to, to check your speed when you see something flashing at you saying that you're speeding to, to do a double check and to slow down, even if it just creates awareness and temporarily reduces speeds, I think it has made a really big difference on that road. Um, pedestrians, Feel more confident. I, I'm a pedestrian on that road frequently and I feel much more confident with those speed bumps and slower drivers and all the additional improvements that we've made. Uh, the seniors who are who are on scooters or in wheelchairs who use that road frequently, parents walking their kids to school, there's just, it, it really has improved that neighborhood. And again, we started to see um, calls for the speed board to be and speed bumps to be placed in other neighborhoods. So we see that as a huge success and it's so successful that we feel we need to set up a calendar system now because there's so many calls for this for the speed reader board to be to be placed in other neighborhoods that we have set out a bit of a calendar so that we'll make sure to be strategic about the location of that mobile unit. Uh, you know, in school zones in September and at the beginning of soccer season and, and other times, and then fit it into other neighborhoods uh, that are experiencing sort of speeding issues. So I guess uh, funding by this Vision Zero program has really helped to create calmer neighborhoods and safer corridors for all road users, for drivers as well as pedestrians and and cyclists. It's created a, a great reminder to drivers just to slow down. This is a residential neighborhood. Um, it's, a, it's a tool that we're using already quite extensively to even monitor how much traffic is on certain roadways and then maybe start to do some planning around diverting traffic uh, off of roadways that aren't maybe suitable to handle that volume. Um, and our experience with the Vision Zero 
program has been very positive. Uh, the administrators have been flexible and responsive to our to our needs when when they've shifted a little bit. And they've genuinely been interested in our project and how it's going and, and what um, road safety improvements you know we're realizing in our community. Um, we do hope that it will encourage drivers to see the importance of slower travel and re reduce the likelihood of injuries and, and accidents. Um, and, and I think the project is making a real difference in our community and people are excited about this speed board and speed bumps. Um, to to uh, one of the things that that's happened as well is that the District of Hunter Mile has recently revived a safety committee. And that safety committee is interested in, in also using these tools that we now have to assess other neighborhoods uh, where we receive um, you know, inquiries. And, and so we're we're just we really had a great experience with the program and we thank Mike and Megan and his team for uh, being supportive and coming out and visiting us and actually walking the streets and seeing seeing our progress and here's a last photo of our members of our council and some of our emergency um, first responders in the community and and uh, so we're we're all really happy with how the project has gone so thank you There we go. Just fantastic. All right. So um, I would like to um, call up uh, Joanne, or sorry, not Joanne. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Jeanette Foreman, <laughs> um, who is the BC CDC lead uh, for Northern Health, who's going to be talking about um, quite a number of the Northern Health projects. Uh, there, I don't think there was able we were able to have a, a project speak in person. Um, uh, but I will let you do a, a full overview of how the program has rolled out in the north. It's quite exciting. Cheers. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Megan mentioned, we are unable to draw somebody from the north away from their very busy schedule to speak today. So the Northern Health Injury Prevention Team thought we'd take this opportunity to share not only just one project, but a handful of projects that have been done in the north with the Vision Zero grant funding. I'm presenting today on behalf of my other team members, which include our medical health officer, Dr. Raquel Kling, and two additional injury prevention leads in the north, Natasha Thorne and Natasha McGreesh and they're joining today online. So I'd like to acknowledge that our work takes place on the uh, territories of the Tlingit, Taltan, Niska, Gitsan, Simshan, Haisla, Haida, Wet'suwet'en, Carrier, Sakani, Denisa, Nihu, Cree, Soto, and Diné peoples in the North. And uh, Northern Health, we also like to recognize the 11 Métis Charter communities in our area, as well as the urban and Indigenous away from home peoples across the Northern Health region. The Northern Health region is geographically the size of France and uh, represents the most rural and remote of all health authorities. Northern Health serves a population of 300,000 across 32 towns, villages, and cities. And we serve individuals from 55 First Nations communities and the 11 Métis Chartered communities that I mentioned. And our region is divided into three health service delivery areas, the Northwest, the Northern Interior, and the Northeast. In year one, or 22-23, uh, the total Vision Zero funding distributed was $99,000, and we uh, funded various projects, including for road safety infrastructure, for infrastructure design, and for public education. You can see the distribution of the year one sites here on the map, so it also was spread across our geography. 
Oh, so sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing <laughs> again. I think I'm one slide ahead of myself on this presenter view. Okay, or one slide behind. Hang on, there we go. Let's see. Nope. Yeah, this one. Okay, so now our one slide behind. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I was wondering why my notes in here weren't showing up. Um, so the, these were the five communities funded. And then in the second year of funding, we had a total of $150,000. Regionally, we contributed $50,000 above the $100,000 provided by the province. And a total of eight communities received funding for projects, again, covering the breadth of infrastructure upgrades for pedestrian and bus traveler safety, the design of sidewalk and cycle path infrastructure, and for public education. And again, uh, so you can see the distribution here. Um, and we are again pleased to see the increase in the number of applications in year two. So we'd like to take a closer look at five of these projects uh, across the Northeast, the Northwest and the Northern Interior. So Soto First Nations are located in the Northeast uh, in the Mulberry Lake, Mulberry Lake and Chetwin area with approximately 1300 members. And they are awarded grants in both year one and year two. In year one, the Soto government applied to have a solar speed reader board installed on their main street to reduce speed of vehicles traveling uh, in, um, across an area where pedestrians were crossing between their playground and a newly built community hall. And through the speed reader board installation process, the Soto Nation was able to work with MOTI to reduce the speed limit on that roadway to 30 kilometers an hour. The addition of playground signs in Plains Cree were also funded and support traditional language use. And just sharing the words here of Tina Demula Meister, who's the Treaty Rights and Environmental Protection Supervisor and lead on the application. Soto First Nations has been focusing efforts on creating public gathering spaces to enrich social interaction and encourage healthy lifestyles. The funding received through the Vision Zero and Road Safety for Vulnerable Road Users program will no doubt increase the safety of our outdoor gathering spaces, parks and playgrounds by providing signage to slow down drivers where children are at play. Thank you Northern Health for this program. So in their second year uh, of the program, uh, Soto First Nations were again successful in their application. And this project included building an ice rink, a sledding hill and a warming shed to provide a centralized and safe location for children and adults to play away from busy roads. They applied for the grant because they had identified a concern with children and community members sledding on various hills throughout the community that were right beside roadways. So you can see one young community member here enjoying the new safe skating space in this photo. Moving to the Northwest in Smithers, my home community of approximately 5,500 people and the traditional territory of the Wet'suwet'en people, funding was obtained in year two of the grant to support community engagement and design of downtown infrastructure, including the addition of a protected bike lane through the downtown center on this street shown here, which intersects the main street. And they're also looking to develop this as the town greenway and they're hoping to update the feeder lane bike lanes into this downtown area. So this project will allow for the collaboration of community and indigenous partners to increase downtown vibrancy and improve accessibility for vulnerable road users. Also in the Northwest, the district of Kitimat with a population of approximately 8,200 people identified five locations from a comprehensive safety assessment where rapid flashing beacons would protect the most vulnerable road users in high use crosswalk areas. So all locations were chosen due to close proximity to schools, churches, playgrounds, and bus stops. And you can see in this picture, one intersection before the installation. And it's directly in front of a school. Moving to the Northern Interior region, Prince George is a city of approximately 73,000 people and it's our largest population center in the north. This is a photo of a very busy intersection located adjacent to College Heights Secondary School. 
It consists of four lanes of traffic, the left-hand traffic lane turning into a school parking lot and with two city bus stops on the opposite ends and the school lot is right before an S-curve. And to top it off, <laughs> it's worth mentioning that the four lanes of traffic also have two bike lanes on either side and often misused by parents as a drop-off uh, location and uh, this obstructs vehicles from seeing pedestrians crossing. So uh, uh, as well as that, the, um, sorry, as well as that, uh, this area has soccer fields nearby and hills that are used for sledding. So not only do school children use this area, it's also very well used by the, the population in general. So this grant was awarded to the College Heights Secondary School Parent uh, Advisory Council with commitment from the city of Prince George to maintain rapid flashing beacons after their installation. Moving just 120 kilometers south of Prince George is the community of Quinell with a population of approximately 23,000 people. And uh, they invested their funds in the bus stop. Um, this is a main bus stop for people living on the Lataco Dene First Nations community, as well as for Red Bluff community. And before the bus shelter was built, transit users would stand next to the heavily trafficked road with vehicles going up to 80 kilometers an hour. And as you can see in this picture, before uh, this uh, bus shelter was built, there would be very high snow banks, which also increased the risk to um, those who are waiting for the bus. So this project again involved collaboration between Indigenous and community partners to provide a safe area for pedestrians to wait for the bus. So you can see we have, um, we've seen huge value from this program at Northern Health and uh, it's <laughs> done, we feel what, exactly what it's intended to do. Um, it's provided, um, significantly to, um, it's it contributed significantly to vibrant communities for active transportation and safe recreation. And um, we are very grateful for the program and we're looking forward to supporting a third year of uh, the program. And so on behalf of the Northern Health Injury Prevention Team, we'd like to thank the communities who have participated We'd like to thank the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure for the funding. And we'd like to thank the BC IRPU staff and team who support the program administratively. And congratulations on your 25th. <laughs> All right, uh, we're running a little behind schedule, so I've been told we're going to just push through the afternoon break. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we can get us back on schedule because I think there's some people who do need to leave on time today. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, up to the podium, Jasmine Chatterth, the uh, Injury Prevention Lead for Fraser Health, and Tobin Copley, the BCCDC uh, Injury Prevention Lead uh, embedded within Fraser Health. And I, I do want to take this opportunity to mention that the genesis of the Vision Zero granting program actually originated in Fraser Health by Tobin and the support of Fraser Health financially. So it's sort of on um, your shoulders, Tobin, that I think we all stand today. You had this idea of how cool, how amazing would it be if we were able to support our local communities in moving forward, uh, the philosophies of Vision Zero and, so, and protecting vulnerable road users. So I really do want to acknowledge um, where this program really did start. So thank you, Tobin. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, take it away. Gosh, um, thank you for that. Uh, no pressure. Um, 
Yeah, I, this is where I can say I'm, I'm just the ideas guy. Um, because I think, um, I was just actually reflecting on this, that it was, uh, it's about six years ago um, that uh, myself and I think it was Michael Schwant uh, was the MHO at the time, um, brought forward the idea to, uh, to our Fraser Health leadership um, in uh, late 20, 2018. Um, and uh, they, um, we, we pitched an idea that we had wanted $35,000 um, to do some community micro grants um, for uh, for Vision Zero, um, and uh, with the vision from the leadership, um, we're very thankful we were able to get that started. And from small things, great things can build. Um, so yeah, um, that's my stuff. We have uh, we're going to have a presentation uh, from Brian Haney, who's a transportation planner at uh, City of Surrey, coming up just after our short um, introduction. Um, yeah, so we're, I'd just like to take a moment here to acknowledge um, that uh, Fraser Health and our Fraser Health, Health region, we provide care on the traditional ancestral and ceded territories um, of the Coast Salish, Coast Salish and Inklapak, Inklapak, I, I practice this, I'm so sorry, um, Inklapak uh, nations and is home to six uh, Métis um, chartered communities. Um, so yeah, from our humble beginnings of thirty-five thousand uh, dollars back in uh, for the twenty nineteen year, uh, I should also point out that um, Vancouver Coastal Health also um, provided uh, funding for their own programs um, that same year. Um, so we over the last uh, two years, um, our program um, has grown under the BC Vision Zero program um, from ninety-nine thousand uh, dollars in the twenty twenty-two twenty-three. Um, year to hundred fifty thousand um, dollars in the present year, um, and um, as Andrea pointed out earlier, our applications open on Monday for our, th our third year. Um, we've grown from ten applications or ten funded applications uh, last year to thirteen this one, um, and uh, the amount uh, we we have the two funding streams for the uh, Indigenous. Um, um, but focus stream as well as the general one. Um, the funding for the indigenous stream has actually remained about, about the same, about 77 to $80,000. Um, but what we've done is we've, um, uh, every one of the uh, five applications um, made to the program this year was funded and funded fully for their full ask um, as a response to um, some feedback uh, from our indigenous uh, partners previous year. Um, and uh, in terms of geographic distribution, um, uh, we have we funded programs throughout the region, both last year um, and as you see this year as well, um, from communities of all sizes, large and small, uh, all the way up the region. What you will notice is that we, um, similar to what Mike was mentioning, we take an equity approach um, to uh, sort of prioritize funding to the smaller communities, to indigenous communities, to ones that have less infrastructure, perhaps less um, support um, internally in the organization. Um, and now I promise I was not gonna speak too long. So I wanna hand it over to my colleague, Jasmine, who will tell you a bit about, um, about our projects uh, and themes this year. Thank you, Tobin. Um, throughout the years, there are three major um, themes that emerged. The first one being active school travel, which includes um, a walking school bus projects and also lane and, and or street closure, in addition to active school travel education projects. Um, we also have um, pedestrian and cyclist safety projects, um, which include RFBs, um, so rapid flashing beacons, um, LED, flashing, uh, LED flashing crossing signs, and others. And our third theme is um, road safety improvements, uh, which includes speed hums, uh, road safety signage, speed and speed uh, reader boards. However, a lot of these do overlap as well. So, um, and I would like to dive in into active, uh, some examples of active school travel projects. Since we have Brian here today, who will be speaking about one of our active school travel projects as well. And just to provide a little bit of a summary, um, in 2022, we had the Lena Shaw School Streets, um, Streets Pilot, which was about temporarily closing the street in front of the school during drop-off and pickup, and to use the vacant space in front of the school 
for engagement regarding um, safety and active um, transportation. Um, one of the 2023 projects is the Gibson Elementary Walking School Bus, um, which encourages fewer vehicles to going to and from school. And it promotes active school travel, educates on road safety, and engages an expert to assess the local walking route options. And the last one is the Windebank Elementary Active School Travel Planning. Um, this project uh, focuses on strengthening the active school stra uh, travel strategy at the school by um, funding dedicated staff members to supervise the walking school bus initiative. Um, with that, I would like to thank um, the BCRPU for this opportunity um, for, the BCR, uh, for the Vision Zero grant and also the ministries that um, help support um, the Vision Zero grant. And if you have any questions, um, you can feel free to reach out to us. And for more of our projects, you can scan the um, QR code as well or and visit the website. Thank you. And now to Brian. Thanks, Tobin and Jasmine for that introduction. Um, it's been great working with you two over the past five or six years as well. Uh, we, I'd like to say City of Surrey has a pretty strong relationship with, with Fraser Health, and Health, and so I hope to continue it. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to talk to you today about the Lena Shaw School Streets pilot. Um, uh, and this was a, a project that we were wanting to do way back in 2019, and we had planned, we had budget for it, um, but unfortunately, 2020. Uh, kind of everything shut down and so we weren't able to implement this in 2020 or 2021 and then by the time it came to uh we can finally start talking about implementing this again uh, unfortunately our uh funding dried up from the budget so we were extremely grateful for this opportunity uh, to have this these funds come from the uh, vision zero grant uh program um also i left out an extremely important word in your organization's name um you can take a look and see it's scattered throughout this presentation. So there is a quiz at the end to see how many times I uh, messed that up. So, um, so very quickly, uh, kind of what we're going to discuss today is I'm going to very briefly go over kind of what school streets are and what their benefits are um, and discuss uh, the pilot at Lena Shaw Elementary School as well. Why did we choose Lena Shaw? Um, go over very briefly some lessons learned and then, you know, what's next on, on the horizon for school streets uh, in Surrey. So we'll go over that a little bit. Um, so essentially school streets are a car free zone in front of pickup drop off areas. Um, um, and they're, they're meant to, uh, you know, kind of reduce the congestion right in front of the school, uh, provide safety for vulnerable road users for those walking, biking, uh, rolling, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, didn't encourage a healthier lifestyles, et cetera. Uh, they really got their start in Europe, um, but a little over half a decade or so ago, they uh, jumped the Atlantic and we've been seeing them in North America quite a bit. And within Canada specifically, uh, they've been kind of scattered all through all the provinces, but you see them a lot in Toronto. Uh, Vancouver has had a program for a number of years, uh, Victoria in the Capital Regional District, and I believe Kelowna or Kamloops uh, had one as well uh, in the past year or so. And there's a kind of a common mantra between all of these projects and we're really not closing the street. Uh, we're really opening it up for other road users and road uses. Um, and, and that'll be shown uh, throughout this presentation here. So our school streets uh, project were primarily aimed at three things, uh, increase safety of vulnerable road users, uh, reduce congestion in front of the school, uh, as well as promote active transportation. But there's also a host of other benefits as well. Uh, you know, they've been shown to foster independent mobility uh, encourage healthier lifestyles, improve air quality, uh, proximity to schools because there's not as much congestion uh, from automobiles. Um, and then lastly, and not least, community connection. And this is something that uh, I didn't know if I would see, like how, it would, how I would see this if I saw this, um, but it was actually pretty apparent by the end of the pilot that, uh, you know, this is a really important benefit as well, and it should be in the top of the goal because when you have people or one of your top goals when you have a strong community connection everybody you're looking out for everybody um and it's kind of that jane jacobs eyes on the street thing so it's very important um so we have about 110 plus elementary schools in the city of surrey uh i mean just absolutely i think this whole the whole uh, enrollment for uh school district 36 is like 75,000 students so uh, larger than most municipalities in dc so why did we pick um 
<clears throat> Lena Shaw Elementary. Well, in Surrey, if you're familiar with Surrey, there's a lot of rural areas in Surrey as well. And that wouldn't be conducive to shutting down a street in front of a school because 99% of the people drive, there's no sidewalks, there's no cycling infrastructure. So they really wouldn't go over very well there. So we really wanted to focus on our more urban schools. Um, and in particular schools that already kind of have a higher uh, active transportation mode share. So there's already a lot of people walking and cycling. You know, we want to be able to protect those vulnerable road users. Uh, as well as uh, a school that has a lot of infrastructure built in on it already. So, you know, we want to see sidewalks, cycling tracks, that sort of thing. Um, and then lastly, and more importantly, is we really wanted to take an equity lens on this. I know we've heard that said quite a bit today, and it's so important. So, Lena Shaw Elementary actually has a very high uh, proportion of their enrollment that are um, uh, recent immigrants and newcomers. So a very high proportion. A lot of them don't own automobiles. They walk, walk anyway. Uh, they, they, they have to walk to get to their, where they're wanting to go into their daily needs. Um, and then we are also several um, uh, low-income family housing uh, uh, within the school management as well that Lena Shaw services. So with all that together, um, we really wanted to, to land on Lena Shaw. And it's just kind of some of the more specific concerns that we were trying to address with this as well um, was centered around the poor driver behavior. So we have actually have done a lot of uh, safety infrastructure improvements uh, over the years. So curb bulges, crosswalks, speed humps, that sort of thing, uh, really restricted where you can park. But um, anybody that has kids and they're dropping their kids off in front of elementary schools knows that uh, those things are not exactly adhered to. Um, and so there was a lot of jaywalking going on where parents would drop their students off on the opposite side of the pickup drop off and they would play like Frogger trying to get to the front of the school. Um, U-turns in front of pickup drop-off areas, so using residents' driveways as kind of a three-point turn access, um, and then lots of illegal parking. So, you know, parents uh, and caregivers parking on crosswalks, in the middle of crosswalks, uh, uh, blocking staff entrances and up against curb bulges. So all that safety infrastructure we put in place was kind of negated by this poor driving behavior. Um, so we just decided to close the street off um, or open it for other road users. Um, so this is, this is kind of an aerial view of Lena Shaw, and I just kind of wanted to give you a, an overview of, of kind of what it looks like in the spatial context. But you can see it's got a pretty decent uh, grid, road grid pattern. So there's a lot of extra places for those people that need to drive. They can park and walk that extra five or 10 minutes to get to school. Um, there's also a lot of sidewalk infrastructure. And so everything you see there in orange, we actually blocked off for 45 minutes uh, during the morning drop off and 45 minutes uh, in the afternoon pickup. So the, the pilot was uh, ran for about, uh, ran for one week on June 5th to the 9th of, of this year. Um, and there was a bunch of stuff that we did the lead up, which was probably a whole lot more work than the actual like pilot itself. Um, we started with some workshops with the, with the PAC, with the students' uh, leadership, as well as admin. So we really wanted to have them along with us on this journey and kind of help uh, vision what this school street would look like and how it would function for their community. Um, we also developed a pretty robust, robust comps plan. Um, Surrey is a pretty, uh, uh, it, it's an interesting community. I mean, there's a lot of driving in Surrey, right? And so anytime you restrict people's right to drive on the street, um, it can be like, uh, it can be very contentious. So we wanted to make sure that we had a, a very uh, nailed down comps plan. So we started out with the actual um, school itself. And so we uh, delivered, um, we delivered newsletters once a week for the weeks leading up to it saying, hey, you know, this pilot's coming. These are the benefits. This is why we're doing it. Uh, do you have any questions? And then um, I also was staked out in front of the school for about two weeks talking to parents uh, kind of one on one. I really wanted to cross my T's and dot my eyes on this one. Um, and then more importantly, or just as important, uh, I had pretty strong engagements with the residents as well. Um, that don't necessarily had students in the school because it would impact their day to day travel patterns as well. Um, so I sent out, you can see the top left there, I sent these postcards out to every single resident within the school catchment. Um, and then and for those residents who um, lived across the street, uh, kind of north of the school street zone there, whose driveways and garages were blocked off, I actually went door to door and had one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with them. Um, and they were, you know, I, I asked them, you know, if you need to leave, you know, maybe park outside the school zone. They're like, we don't leave 
during pickup and drop off times anyway. Like our driveways, our parking lots, we can't get out. So whatever you want to do, go for it. So that made me feel a lot better. Um, we also developed a very short pilot, uh, post pilot survey. So we really wanted to understand um, kind of what are your attitudes and opinions of the school street afterwards, you know, and did you change your travel behavior because of it? Um, and then lastly, and uh, this is extremely important, is we built our partners and networks. Um, we didn't do this alone. We relied heavily with not only Fraser Health, but with uh, Surrey RCMP and Surrey RCMP Volunteer Services, uh, ICBC, um, as well as the, the school PAC so it was, and, the, and the school district. So it was kind of an all hands on deck on this. And it kind of helped uh, spread the risk and the load out a little bit. Um, and I don't think you would be able to uh, have a successful pilot, a school streets pilot without that network. So what did it look like on the ground? Um, so it was pretty simple. We had uh, these uh, barricades here that we posted some signs on and we uh, uh, city staff and or, and or RCMP member placed them out uh, twice a day, every day for, uh, for a week. Um, and then moving kind of to the right there, we also wanted to have this school street zone be kind of a, uh, uh, a, a more of an active place, right? And so we, we, we greeted the, the parents with coffee every morning and some road safety literature and, you know, other propaganda telling them not to run over small children. Um, and so it was really great to get those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, we also did stuff for students as well. We did handouts for the students. So, you know, we handed out stickers and reflective armbands, um, lights that they can clip on, that sort of stuff, safety related stuff. Um, and that went out real, that went over really, really well. And we were able to have some good conversations with the caregivers. Um, in the afternoon, we, we kept the street open uh, a little bit longer past the bell. And we always tried to have some sidewalk chalk or some games or something fun for the students to do to really enjoy their space in front of the school. Um, and going back to that community connection piece, one thing I really noticed here is before and after is pick up and drop off was really a transaction, right? They would pull up in front of the school, drop the kids off and drive off and uh, drop the kids off and drive off. And, you know, there was, a, it's just so routine. There wasn't a lot of uh, 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 connection with that process. Um, but during the pilot, what we noticed is families kind of lingered afterwards, especially in the PM, and they chatted and they talked. And uh, it was really great to see that. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to, to touch on that piece. And then on the bottom right, I wanted to say, you know, it was a one week pilot and it wasn't always sunny. On the last day, it actually rained pretty hard, uh, which was unfortunate and a little ironic because we were going to have an ice cream social that day with the students. Um, but, you know, there was still a lot of people that, that uh, and students and caregivers that walked and biked that day. So it was, it was great to see that, you know, they just had their umbrellas. They weren't going to melt away, though their ice cream kind of did in the rain. Um, but we did, we did uh, enjoy some ice cream and it was a great wrap up to the event. Um, so as I, I mentioned, we did do a post pilot survey and um, I'd be happy to share all of the responses to this, but I kind of wanted, really wanted to highlight too. Um, this first one kind of goes with what Kate mentioned earlier in the introduction to this session. And that was that kind of um, uh, 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 perception of safety versus actual safety and how both of those really do a lot to promote active transportation. And we asked the question, you know, did the school street uh, feel safer during pickup and drop off than it did before the program? And 82% of the people said that it did feel safer. So that was great to hear. Um, and then lastly, we just wanted to know, you know, did the school street encourage you to do more or less of, of this particular mode? And we had 38% of the people saying they walked more, um, 19 said they biked more, 19%. And then we had about 29% said that they drove less. Um, so our sample size on this or our respondents was only about, a, a, it was around a third, a quarter to a third of the population. But um, even just the one-on-one -on -one conversations I had with, with uh, caregivers in the front and school teachers and admin as well. Um, you know, it was, it was very positive. And I should mention that with the school teachers as well and the admin is uh, they're usually the ones that have to take the brunt of all the craziness that goes off in front of the school. Um, and so they were extremely excited about this pilot. Um, and maybe I should have added this as a lesson learned that we'll talk about here in a minute, but uh, they are your champion for kind of getting everybody uh, interested in this um, and excited for it. Um, so did we meet our goals? It's really, really complicated. I mean, active school travel is extremely complicated to begin with, but this was a one week pilot and we were just kind of testing the waters here. Um, so it's really hard to say if this had any long-term impacts. Um, 
you know, um, and then there's that kind of, do we meet our safety objectives? It's hard. It's one week and it's at the end of school. School starts again in the September and there's a whole nother cohort of students and parents coming in that didn't get to participate in the school streets. Um, so really, it, it's, it's really hard to say if it achieved its goals. But I think that what we can and what's exciting is that we were quite um, worried about the risk of this program in Surrey. Um, but on the other, but on the other side of the pilot now, we can say that we actually have quite a bit of community and organizational support. So um, the engineering department and the city of Surrey in general is really supportive of this and want to see this move forward uh, again. So we're going to be a do, doing a more substantial pilot uh, in Newton in 2024. So we're hoping to do a semester long pilot, which is pretty exciting. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, I can share, share more on that uh, at another time. So lessons learned. Um, what's a pilot without having some lessons learned? Um, we've learned a lot, but here's four that were kind of uh, uh, really apparent to us. Um, I think for a longer term deployment, you know, we're going to have to have uh, volunteers. We're going to have to have the school community have buy-in on this. They really need to take ownership of it. It can't just be incumbent on the city to come out every single day and put out barricades and the RCMP telling people where to go. Um, it really needs to be a community-driven uh, initiative. Um, we've seen this, you, you've seen this a little bit in Vancouver. They've really switched to the more volunteer uh, centric model um, for all the same reasons. Um, another thing too, is there need, needs to be a greater flexibility to allow those with additional mobility needs to access the school street pilot. So when we first started this, we had a hard block, nobody in or out. We did make a, a little section for those that uh, may have mobility issues and as well as school buses to, to park a little bit closer. Um, but we heard pretty quickly that we need to make some concessions for that. So by the third day or so, we actually were allowing those individuals to come in escorted. Um, and it worked out just fine. So I think moving forward, you know, there needs to be a little bit of work around that. Um, we did involve the students a little bit in the planning process. Um, but I think there's more that could have been done. Um, this is a street for them. I really want the students to have complete ownership of this thing. Um, so really getting them excited for it, getting their parents excited for it, getting the community excited for it. It's something we'll do moving forward. Um, and then lastly, don't prematurely discount resident buy-in. And I think this may be just more specific to the organization I'm in is uh, don't be too risk averse that you don't go try something out because you never know what the outcomes are going to be until you try it. Um, so that was a really good lesson learned. So what are the next steps? Um, like I said, there's a desire to can continue on school streets with a long-term pilot. Uh, we're going to be focusing on Newton community in 2024. Um, and in between that time, we started to develop a, a training program uh, for volunteers, students, et cetera, to help facilitate the school streets moving forward. So we can take a little bit of the, the ownership or they can take a little bit of the ownership and, and load off of us. Um, so with that being said, I just wanna thank everybody who participated in this, uh, especially DC Injury Research and Prevention, uh, Fraser Health, uh, Surrey RCMP and RCMP Volunteers, uh, ICBC, um, and obviously the Lena Shaw Pack. Thank you. Okay. All right. So next up is Island Health. Um, and so I would like to, uh, to call up to the podium, Neil Arison. Um, and uh, Neil is the injury lead for BCCDC placed within Island Health. Um, and I would also be remiss if I did not also mention that Neil Arison is the genesis for this program at the Ministry of Health. So building on great ideas, Neil was really the one who was able to champion this within the ministry. And we're so grateful, Neil, for you to make, have made this program sort of what it is today. And Andrea has taken it, I think, to the nth degree with Kate. So thank you, Neil. And yeah. 
Okay, I will let you take it away and uh, so introduce we're your own. Coffee break, but we're not. No, we're not. Okay, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I'm just it's those people. Don't have to worry you. about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Megan. Well, myself and others like like Andrea and, jo and Jonathan Robinson in Ministry of Health who helped start, and a lot of others, always go back to Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health too, who are the inspiration for the Vision Zero project, actually. Anyway, it takes a lot of people to grow it and build it and keep it going as well. Anyway, I'm just gonna do a little five minute overview and the BCRRPU and, and Ian as well. Um, and then I'm gonna pass it over to, Je to, um, to Robin, who you'll meet in a few minutes to showcase one of our Island Health Vision Zero projects. Oh yeah, so I have to, how do I um, operate the machinery? <laughs> you got this. Uh, oh, I just hit the down button, the down arrow. Yes. Right, of course. So your slide is scary. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> just hit the down arrow. Um, anyway, um, such a pleasure to be here, everyone in person and as well as those online. I'm uh, very humbled to, <laughs> live and work on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Songhees and the Victoria Métis Chartered Nation as well. Um, and this is just want to give a shout out as well to our Island Health Adjudication Committee, which is all of the excellent people uh, listed there. Uh, we also had two professional engineers on our adjudication committee, which was actually really, really great. And uh, thank you to Mian Strong, our uh, manager of finance in Island Health, and grateful to the ministries of education, of, uh, of uh, health and uh, transportation and infrastructure for the, for the three-way funding for our program to make it possible as well. Uh, in our first year, we had six projects, and, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but most of them were uh, mid-island and, and south. And in year two, we actually had 14 communities um, uh, involved in projects, and we we're very proud that uh, they crossed all three tribal regions of Island Health, the Coast Salish, the New Chalmath, and the Kwakwake Waku tribal regions. So we were able to impact all those communities. And our, over both years, a huge breadth of projects, video analytics, traffic calming, speed radar, improved crosswalks, leading pedestrian intervals, all kinds of things. Um, and overall, all of these projects, I think, help move uh, uh, road safety in terms of modal shift, moving people away from cars to uh, active travel, <laughs> separating vulnerable road users through space and time from traffic, reduced motor vehicle speeds, which is huge, and there's many ways to do that, and actually just providing more guidance to drivers like crosswalks, for example. Um, so just to showcase, um, oops, yeah, so we, again, we had three we had the privilege of working with three indigenous communities in year two, this, uh, the Songhees Nation, which was about uh, reduced motor vehicle speeds and new stop signs in the Lekwungen language. Um, and then also in uh, the Sacred Circles driver licensing pilot in the New Chalmath region, which was about uh, supporting indigenous people to uh, get a driver's license in their home community and all of the good things that that would lead to. And, um, in the uh, village of Yehadasat, um, working on directional signage and wayfinding in sort of a remote area there. And then just more um, in terms of uh, other projects, just a few others, uh, just that we can just uh, showcase a bit. One is Ecole Oceanside Elementary in year one. So you can see a whole bunch of portable traffic calming devices. This was, this was a project for, uh, led by a very keen uh, parent advisory council and that equipment would go in and out, but there was some equipment like a speed reader that would stay outside, obviously, but a very innovative project and really led by a very energetic group of, uh, of parents. And this is the Macaulay Heights Road and Area Net, uh, Neighborhood. Um, this is in the Comox Valley near Black Creek, and it was a basically much better access and safer access turning off of the road into this parking lot. Uh, improved sight lines and then this would enable people to actually go to this park and, and get out and walk and, and use its trails as well. Um, and then I had the privilege on June 19th of att attending the ribbon cutting event for a new crosswalk outside Hans Halveson <laughs> Elementary. Uh, so this included a new crosswalk ahead pavement markings, school markings, and a refuge area for uh, 
for pedestrians. And then this one, if you look at the photo on the far right, that might be the most boring Vision Zero project in North America, that signal box. <laughs> but that signal box, this, our investment into, that, uh, into this project was updating that signal box so that it could uh, basically, um, um, they could implement a leading pedestrian interval at Beacon Avenue and 7th Avenue in Sydney, in the town of Sydney. And that is very cool because putting pedestrians ahead at crosswalks at signalized lights is very, is proven. In fact, the, uh, my friends in Modi tell me the US Department of Transportation Clearinghouse is the place to look uh, for crash reduction modification factors and pedestrian inter leading intervals have a 58%, a whopping 58% reduction in uh, vehicle pedestrian collisions. So it's a very, very uh, cool thing and relatively low cost way to improve safety. And with that, I just wanted to turn it over to, to Robin. Uh, she's a lead for a year one grant project, the Cycling Skills and Safety on Salt Spring Island project. Robin is a mother, biologist, environmental educator and cycling enthusiast who lives on Salt Spring. She's also an outreach director for Island Pathways, a nonprofit that's advocated for safer active transportation on Salt Spring for 35 years. And over the years, Island Pathways has partnered with many groups to construct pathways in and around the village of Ganges, erect interpretive kiosks, and educate and encourage everyone to walk and cycle and do it in a safer manner without, with less uh, reliance on the automobile. And now we just switch this over to uh, your presentation. Let's see. That looks good. That looks good, eh? Yeah. That was lucky. <laughs> oh, we just fast forward. Great okay. job. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely. We're getting this. Well, thanks for this opportunity to share what some of what we've been up to thanks to the Vision Zero grant program. <laughs> Um, on Salt Spring Island, we'd originally intended to erect some speed reader boards. And when we went to our local transportation committee and said, hey, we got some money for this, I think we embarrassed them into finding their own money to do that work. So then we were able to shift to more of the skills education and some more um, innovative projects I'll share with you. So um, we were able with this funding to launch the West Coast pilot of a program called All Kids Bike. We had uh, used some of the funding for the grade four, five skills and safety courses um, with Capital Bike at the school and found that a handful of the kids didn't even know how to ride a bike. On Salt Spring, there aren't a lot of long, flat, paved areas for kids to learn. So we decided to find a program that would teach all children at the schools to ride a bicycle in two weeks of phys ed um, using Strider bikes with a pedal conversion kit, um, which I highly recommend. It's been a lot of fun. So we have 25 Strider bikes, and um, there was so much interest in this that we had a lot of outside contributions of funding as well, allowing us to stretch the Vision Zero funding further. So we also bought about 80 uh, youth and child bike helmets that we were able to then give away at uh, bike to school events and um, fit properly to children. And then um, we have also offered a uh, e-bike freedom 55 plus safety and skills course. The leading source of the economy on Salt Spring is pensions. So you can imagine a lot of people are going back to riding bikes with e-bikes. It's so hilly that these e-bikes are making Salt Spring and the other Gulf Islands more rideable. So um, there's been a sort of moderate uptake on that course that we've been able to do twice now because uh, it's still the perception of safety on Salt Spring is um, people really feel unsafe riding on the 0.1 to 0.5 uh, meter uh, gravelly shoulders along the main routes that are 80 kilometers per hour, surprisingly. So um, we decided to try to tackle uh, some of the road maintenance along those uh, streets. And we'll talk about that in a second. Here's a picture of the all kids bike program being led you can see the tiny scoop bikes and those pedals on there you add those on the second week 
And um, we've now gotten some other grant funding to expand to the other two elementary schools. So all the kids on Salt Spring will learn to ride a bike in K-1 now. Um, this is showing some of our uh, just different programs. Um, some of the research on how do we shift our society to a lower carbon, healthier, um, active transportation modes shows that if you learn to ride a bicycle as a child, you're much, much, much more uh, likely to ride it as an adult and probably have better balance and, and other skills. So that's why we felt this was important to do the helmets and all kids bike. And then um, there's lots of information that you know better than I do about the importance of exercise uh, as we get older and uh, the benefits of safely riding e-bikes in particular on the Gulf Islands. We um, have had lots of activities over the years. It's been great. So next we thought we would advocate for some street sweeping. There have been a lot of uh, cycling accidents uh, due to road gravel. Um, there is no provision in MCON, our road maintenance um, contractor for MOTI to do any shoulder sweeping because uh, the bike lanes are there there's 800 meters about of sporadic bike lanes that aren't um that were only able to be installed with local groups uh, promising to maintain them but those groups disappeared so um we we organized a barbie street sweeping event um how many of you have seen barbie yeah, so Barbie stands for equal safety for all road users. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. So we all dressed up as Barbies and Kens. And uh, it ended up that CBC picked up the story for morning news. And uh, suddenly Moti found uh, some extra money for a, for a street sweep. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just show you a quick uh, video how do i do this sorry oh okay escape you want to do the privilege of oh sure okay <laughs> click hey we're trying to clean up the road shoulders to ask Moti to fund a few more road sweepings. This year, they never even got around to it. Uh, there are two cyclists who have recently fallen and gone to the hospital, Janice Parker and another young man earlier last year. We really, really want some cleaner shoulders for cyclists. <laughs> and if somebody wants to help for the next one, what do you, what, what, how can people get involved or support you? Well, join Island Pathways today, islandpathways.ca. We are working to get bike paths. Island Pathways did all the gravel walking paths with lots of partners. We're just trying to make it easier to walk and bike on Salt Spring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this time for a break. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get Let's see. If you have to, let's go. Oh, okay. I, so, thank you so much, Phoebe. Um, lastly, um, because of the current state of the contracts with MCON and MOTI and the glacial pace at which things happen, we decided to contract a local e-bike mechanic to design a, a e-trike street sweeper that could double as a cycling beyond age, if you've heard of that, um, tuk-tuk. So um, we now have the design and the um, specs and the materials lined up to construct um, uh, electric trike with a motorized road sweeper, push road sweeper that's been electrified onto the front of the trike that we can uh, ride along the road shoulders and sweep the gravel to the side and then swap out the front seats when we like to um, hopefully start a cycling uh, without age um, 
program on Salt Spring. And if you haven't heard of that, you should really look it up. It's incredible. It's a program where um, you get training to take um, elders out on bicycle rides um, to help them get fresh air and enjoy the community. And it also leads to kind of a greater awareness of cycling and safety for, for everyone. Um, so yes, we are trying to tackle, um, we've uh, our organization kind of completed a walking pathway network through Ganges this year. And so now we're focusing on this cycling safety and thanks to Vision Zero, we've um, been able to make advances on a lot of these um, solutions, these tactics. Um, and our end goal, of course, is working towards a bike path across Salt Spring from Vesuvius to Fulford as, as part of a larger 250 kilometer loop uh, regional network trail called the Salish Sea Trail Network. So um, that's all. And if you'd like to get in touch, please do. All right, thank you so much. Okay, uh, next up is uh, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, so I'd like to invite up Kirby Kiambao, the uh, BCCDC injury lead of, uh, embedded in Vancouver Coastal Health and Joanne Sadler, who is the injury lead within the Vancouver General Hospital Trauma Program. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, here to talk about uh, projects within the Vancouver Coastal Health region. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. We forgot our Barbie outfits, maybe next time. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, do you wanna come? Uh, my name is Joanne, uh, Injury Prevention Lead with VGH Trauma Services. Uh, was involved in year one of the Provincial Vision Zero grant. And then this is Kirby. Is um, I would like to congratulate the BCIRPU oh. for their 25th anniversary. I'm also grateful and happy to be a member of the unit itself. So um, thanks Ian and Shalina. Um, I guess I, I can attest that Farah is really a good cook. So <laughs> I, I second that for Shalene. Okay, and I uh, would just like to start by acknowledging um, as we have today, but uh, Vancouver Coastal Health Authority lies on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, so our Vancouver Coastal Health Authority um, provides care to more than 1.25 million British Columbians, Columbians over three health service delivery areas. So we have Richmond, Vancouver, and then the North Shore Coast Garibaldi area. Uh, in year one of the Provincial Vision Zero Grant Program, we had 12 applications uh, from Vancouver Coastal Health. We awarded six Stream 1 projects and four Stream 2 projects for a total of $183,000 in funding. And in year two, we received 25 applications and awarded five Stream 1 projects and five Stream 2 projects for a total funding of $195,000. And we also have our maps. Uh, here are our year one recipients. Um, so you can see we have quite the geographical spread. Um, some of our recipient communities are quite rural and remote and quite far from where we are right now in Vancouver. Um, for example, New Hot Nation is about a 12 hour drive on Google Maps from here. Um, so we, yeah, we, we have quite the, the spread. And then same with year two. And we had some repeat uh, recipients as well, which, which is great. And so now I'll pass it on to Kirby to go over some of our projects that we had. So here's the quick summary of our projects grouped into four themes. Um, and it shows which communities are doing what. Our successful grantees range from local governments, uh, school districts, 
uh, nonprofit organizations, and indigenous communities. The number of applications we received from, from last year uh, compared to this year um, certainly doubled. Well, we were delighted that our granting, uh, that this granting program um, had taken the interests of different communities looking um, to make roads safer. So I'm just gonna share some of the codes and photos of some of our projects. So I'll, I'll begin from uh, the Richmond Poverty Reduction Coalition. And I'm actually grateful that the, one of the representative came um, today. So their project, uh, Support a Pedestrian Safety Survey, designed and executed by a network of low-income Richmond residents with uh, live experience. And then the photo on your top right is from the city of Powell River, which addressed speeding around the Henderson Elementary School through installations of different traffic calming measures. And then lastly, the photo uh, at the bottom is from the school district 46, which used the, the bus routes to school maps to encourage safe and active travel, ultimately increasing the number of children walking and cycling to school. And I drew these slides here. I think every one of us know um, a lot uh, about speeding. Um, and I borrowed this photo um, on your left uh, from the city of Edmonton report that reports the survivability rate of a person hit by a car at varying speeds. So, um, but regardless of how it is, sorry, I'm, I'm sure that some of us have seen these kinds of statistics in this form or, um, something similar in nature, but regardless of, of how it was presented, we know that speeding um, causes severe injuries or deaths. Um, speeding makes the driver lose control of vehicles. It makes braking and stopping distance greater when danger is perceived. The crash severity is higher, and as an effect, um, the society suffers productivity loss. And then lastly, speeding increase fuel consumptions as well. But I would like to pivot ourselves to a more optimistic story. And I'd, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Andrew Van Eden from the, um, from the Tsleil-Waututh uh, Nations. And Andrew is the community safe manager to share um, his projects in his community. Thank you very much. I think this is the end. I think I'm the final one. We've almost made it. Uh, I'm standing in the way of you and your car. So I'll, I'll try to get us through this so you don't speed out of here. Uh, my name is Andrew Van Eden. I'm the Community Safety Manager at Slaywichuth, where I've been for the last 20 years. Uh, I primarily work with criminal justice and policing, but I do a lot of safety work in the community, uh, including emergency management. Um, we are really excited about this Vision Zero grant. Uh, I can tell you in my 20 years, this is a highlight opportunity for us uh, and I'm going to explain the reasons why. First of all, Slaywatuf, you've heard the name. You may have been uh, through the community, you may not. Uh, Slaywatuf is a small, progressive, fairly urban First Nation community. We are at the base of Mount Seymour uh, on the North Shore, right along the Burrard Inlet. Um, in addresses are North Vancouver. The traditional territory, of course, expanding throughout the lower mainland and up to Sea to Sky. Uh, there are about 600 members of the community, with about half of them living. Uh, on reserve. Uh, I want you to perhaps have a look at that map, and I know you can't see it super clearly, but the left side of the map is what we refer to mostly as the village of Slewatuf. It is where the community themselves lives. There's one north-south road, Slewatuf Road, uh, that goes from the bottom of the picture there to the top. All of the residents live either there or along the waterfront. What you're seeing on the right side of your map is Ravenwoods and Seymour Village. These are leased land developments of about 3,000 individuals who are leasing a townhouse or a condominium uh, and living on reserved land. So, uh, you know, we're looking at like 3,500 people total in the reserve population. Uh, and I would also note to you, along the bottom of that map, you can see a road, kind of a curvy road. That's Dollarton Highway. We're going to talk a lot about that in the few minutes that we have together. Uh, Dollarton is the main arterial, arterial road. Um, that runs east-west from about Highway 1, Second Narrows Bridge, all the way into Deep Cove, if you've been to Deep Cove before. Um, Mount Seymour Parkway would be just north of the map that you're looking at there to orient us a little bit. 
Road safety, huge issue, number one issue. Uh, we work very closely with the Integrated First Nations Police Unit, which is our enhanced police service, as well as the North Vancouver RCMP. Uh, and traffic safety is a significant issue for Slayer community. The Dollarton Highway, I don't have time to go in the history of it, but I can say that from those I've spoken to in the community, the road was a gravel pathway uh, and not that many generations ago. Uh, it eventually um, got taken over. The province used it as a provincial highway uh, and then it got offloaded sort of to the municipality. It went to a court case. Slaywitzuth was then paid for the road to be given over to the municipality and it's been completely expropriated from the reserve. It is fully uh, run and owned by the district of North Vancouver, including the light posts, the sidewalks, curbing, uh, road maintenance, all of that. Um, what it's done, if you remember from the map, is that it's separated the community. Uh, there are homes along the water that are now separated from the rest of the community. All of the people along the water need to access the relatives, they need to access services, um, either in the office or our school, and vice versa. The rest of the community is coming down to see their family along the water. And so that busy roadway has created a separation uh, for people. We have had a nation member die on Dollarton Highway from a drunk driver uh, a few decades ago. And I can tell you that numerous family pets have lost their lives on this stretch of roadway, cats and dogs in particular. Uh, but we also know that there's a significant amount of wildlife. If you remember from the map, the village was on one side, the lease land on the other, there was a huge forest in between. Uh, we have a lot of deer, coyote, bear, uh, and other small animals that are going back and forth, accessing the shoreline and the water and into the forest. We've had uh, a bear killed on Dollarton a couple of years ago, hit by a car, and we have anywhere from five to 10 deer um, along the Dollarton that are killed each summer from motorists. There is only <laughs> one crosswalk and the reserve portion of Dollarton Highway. Uh, it's in a bad location, it's unsafe. Here's your sight line. As you enter the reserve on Dollarton, I've pulled off just to the side of the road. There's a little bump out there. Uh, and I've given you the opportunity to see what it looks like to enter the community along Dollarton, heading east on the roadway. There are two safety infrastructure pieces in this photo. You may be able to find one of them. I know you will not be able to find the other one. If you are a motorist entering this roadway, the speed limit is 40 kilometers per hour. The rest of Dollarton off reserve is 50. So if you are on Dollarton, you're doing 50, you hit the reserve boundary, you're now going down to 40. It's even slower to get to your destination. Um, there is no outlet. Once you get to the village of Deep Cove, the road ends. You have to come back through again, uh, either through the parkway or Dollarton. So these are people who are just trying to get from point A to point B, uh, and they want to get there quickly. If you are one of those motorists on this uh, stretch of roadway, there is a crosswalk just outside of the view of this photo. The road, as it hits the peak, turns to a curve, so you cannot see where that crosswalk is. I've highlighted the two pieces of safety infrastructure. The one uh, up above is a speed reader board. It's a small black box in the lamppost there. It's been there for a few years, um, and it is one of those flashy speed boards that does get your attention. Sometimes people ignore it, those who live kind of close by are just sort of used to it. It's just this flashing light in their face and sometimes they slow down and sometimes they don't. Um, the other piece that you cannot see, the one that I've circled that's very close to the road is actually the amber light bar on the pedestrian crosswalk because you can actually, if it was lit up, you would just see a tiny little yellow right at the surface of the road there because of the angle of the road. Uh, it is a very unsafe location for the crosswalk to be and it is very challenging for you to see as a driver, if you are doing the speed limit of 40, maybe even a couple over, you have the time to come to a complete stop to see the flashing lights and uh, to stop for pedestrians. If you are going faster than that, it is challenging for you to recognize what's in front of you and stop in time. And although the amber lights are there, they've only been there for about two years. Uh, and we have numerous stories of community members standing there waiting and waiting and waiting despite the flashing light for motorists to actually stop. I've moved a little further along on the road. So now I'm standing almost underneath the speed reader board and you can now see where those two cars are, where the pedestrian crosswalk is. 
There is signage there, there's paint on the road, and there are the amber flashing yellow lights. Just to your left of the uh, crosswalk is Slaywitzith Road. It is an intersection. It's the reason why road engineers in those little matrix that they use to determine where things go chose to put the crosswalk there because it's an intersection. Um, it's not where we wanted it to be uh, because of the unsafe conditions of the roadway in that location, but it is where the standard says it should be. We have a new outdoor learning based K-12 school in the community since COVID times. Um, we have about 50 students that attend that school. It is outdoor based. Those students on a regular basis are accessing the forest, but also the beach. For them to access the beach, they would come down Slaywitzith Road and stay in the north side of Dollarton using the sidewalk until they got to the beach access point, but then they'd have to cross without a crosswalk. Or they could cross here at this crosswalk, walk on the south side of the road and only have a, a sidewalk for a portion of the way. The rest of the time would either be in a small strip of grass or walking on the road itself. So we don't have the safety infrastructure we need to safely have those students accessing part of the community. We also have canoe pullers during the canoe season from about April to August. The canoe shed is at the very end of the road there before that last curve uh, on the water side. People are accessing that canoe shed during rush hour in the evenings. They're coming down through their relatives' yards. They're coming to the curb. They're checking for traffic quick and they're running across. Kids, adults, sometimes they're even loading up canoes on vehicles uh, and having lots of issues with speeding traffic. So. Needless to say, we have a lot of safety issues, a lot of safety concerns related to the roadway. Um, the community, because of the way in which the road was expropriated, uh, it's literally taken personal when you speed. The community actually considers it a fence when, they, when, when they're down there and they see you speeding. It's, it's that personal. And I think because of the loss of the relative on the road as well, uh, it's that personal. We've had three or four demonstrations or protests along the roadway in the 20 years that I've been there people wanting to raise awareness. There for a moment. So this for us is the new opportunity. This for us is the opportunity to engage community in doing something. They know it's unsafe. They know that they have told their own elected officials and municipal elected officials, please help us find a new way make the roads safe, do what you have to do. But we are at the mercy of the municipality and they have chosen not to do much over the decades uh, of requests. And so it can feel a bit helpless as a community. Uh, and I would say that the, the Vision Zero grant for us is a very empowering opportunity. It's literally given the community something tangible that they can do to contribute to the safety of Dollarton Highway. So a Speedwatch program, um, and maybe I will forward it to the photo. Um, one second. Our Speedwatch program, if you're not familiar with the Speedwatch program, you can see the folks here being tra trained. Uh, they are community members who are given a two hour training by ICBC's road safety unit. Uh, we place a mobile speed reader board along the roadway, uh, which tracks uh, vehicle speed. Um, and we, collect the data. The board that we have that we're able to purchase through this grant, uh, they're very sophisticated now. They literally, you can put a thumb drive in, it records all the traffic, you can pop it into a computer and it gives you a nice um, layout of, of all that data. Um, but that's, that's not the empowering part. That's not the community engaged part. Speedwatch is. So we are having the volunteers go down and tabulate that data. Every vehicle that passes us gets tabulated in what their speed was. Um, we share that data with the RCP, we share it with ICBC, and we will use it uh, with the District of North Vancouver to help create some engineering change to the roadway, hopefully down the road. Uh, we had 10 people, now 12, come forward to be volunteers. That's a huge turnout. That's more than North Vancouver has for their whole Speedwatch program. Seven of them, seen in the picture here, were able to get trained. Uh, by ICBC's road safety unit for the two hours. Um, and so we are ready to go. Uh, we also were able to purchase a second speed reader board and have donated it to the District of North Vancouver to place on Dollarton 
for westbound traffic. You've seen the one for eastbound traffic. Now we're gonna have another one coming the other way. And so we're working through that process with them to hand it over. They will now own it and maintain it for us. And I'll close for you. We have just last week had our first Speedwatch campaign. Um, Elder Rose and uh, community member Mabel were both set to join me. Uh, Elder Rose was not feeling well that day. So Mabel and I went out to the road ourselves. It's more ideal to have three of us, but the two of us made it work. Uh, this is what happened uh, on that day. So you can see there's our fancy board along the side of the road. Uh, and we set up just inside of where the speed limit changes from 50 to 40. And we did it during rush hour from about 4.15 <clears throat> to 5.45. And in that amount of time, 770 vehicles passed us. That is a significant number of vehicles in a area that is almost entirely residential. Within that, about just over half of those coming through, we're doing the speed limit or less. Um, it's a little bit skewed because if you have about 10 cars in a pile coming through and the first car is speeding and they see the board and they slow down, the next six, seven, eight, nine cars are also going to be in the green zone and complying when we know they probably wouldn't have been otherwise. But we'll take that. We'll give them their 50%. Uh, about 29% um, of the people were doing about 1 to 10 kilometers per hour over the speed limit. So somewhere around 41 to 50 kilometers per hour. Police probably aren't going to pull you over in that kind of speed range. So we anticipate you know, that 82% or so of drivers are safely moving through the community for the most part. They would be able to stop for the crosswalk. Once they hit that blind curve, it is a straightaway. Sometimes we have elders crossing there. We, we feel comfortable that they are likely to be people who would be able to stop in time for that. Then we move to the red zone and that actually should say 11 to 20 over, not just 20 over. So these are the people doing 51 to 60 in a 40 kilometer per hour zone. Uh, and we had 129 cars doing that. Um, the worst ones, the bad ones are doing 21 or more over. They're doing 61 in a 40. Uh, and I can tell you uh, 11 vehicles going 20 or more over is pretty significant. Uh, I have data from the North Van RCMP Speedwatch program over the last three years. Uh, they come out about quarterly uh, and they've never had more than one or two. Um, and so to see 11 vehicles uh, going that high rate of speed is concerning to us. That says to us that there's about 18% of the vehicles which is about 140 vehicles in 90 minutes that are potentially a danger. Uh, and, and Curvy shared that great statistic around speed and surviving a crash. Um, we want to work using this program to bring awareness, to reduce that 18% down. Those are the people we're gonna be most focused on, trying to get them uh, to slow down in the area. We know most of the driving public that comes through there are indeed local residents. So if we're out there consistently and they see that message, we hope that they will more regularly slow down. We are also keeping track of bicycles. There were 20 bicycles that passed by during that time that are interacting with those 770 vehicles. Uh, Dollarton, if you've been there, is very challenging. There is no shoulder. Uh, there is no real shared roadway um, because of the narrow nature of it and the very tall curbs uh, that run along it. Uh, we don't have the ability to expand the road because then we're expropriating more reserve land and having to give it to the municipality to expand the roadway. So we are kind of locked in with the way the road is and it is challenging for bikes, but it's a beautiful ride if you've ever done it. And so we wanna help slow traffic for the bicyclists that are also coming through. And lastly, we had one cat cross the road while we were out there. Uh, we are keeping track of people's pets because we know that pets uh, significantly have passed away uh, over the years. Just prior to us getting down there, there was a mother deer and her two babies that had also crossed in the very spot that we were set up uh, to head down to the water. So uh, we know wildlife is also very active there. So um, I will leave it at that for now, but just to say how excited we are for the program, how excited we are to have the Vision Zero grant to be able to take this on. Our next campaign is October 21st. We're gonna go out on a Saturday morning and try to slow down some of those Saturday morning park users uh, we'll be out again later in October, and then we'll be out again on Halloween, uh, again, to raise awareness. Um, I'm really excited to continue to train more community members uh, so that we can actively have a group very present down there to slow the traffic and make it a safe roadway for all road users. Thank you very much.
Okay. All right, so that concludes our presentations for the Vision Zero Grant program today. Um, I really hope that Kat didn't use one of his nine lives because when you've got that many people <laughs> going at that, at that speed, I know that place so well. Um, and so I'm so excited to see how this, this program eventuates and, and the impact that, and hopefully the information that it can collect to hopefully convince those further changes that I think the nation has, been, has long been, been hoping for. All right. Um, so I think now it's over to Ian and, uh, and Shalina. So um, just before we give our closing words, we want to really recognize the amount, incredible amount of work uh, two individuals that have put into the planning in particular of this symposium, Phoebe and Anita, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for all your work. And for your time. Um, you know, it's, it's really humbling um, to hear all the kind remarks from everybody uh, over the past 25 years. Um, as we were planning this, I was reflecting on all the work and seeing all the older reports really brought back a lot of memories. So it's really nice to know that the work that we're doing has and is continuing to make a difference. Um, I'm really privileged to be working with the BCIRPU family. It really is a family but not just the BCRPU family, the injury prevention family, all our, our, all our partners, all our collaborators. It really is a privilege to work with each and every one of you. So thank you. Thank you, Shalina. Um, this morning we started with some words, uh, recognizing the leadership, the vision, the innovation, and I guess the risk that the Ministry of Health took by investing in the BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit. And throughout the day, we've heard stories about a continuing investment and support by that ministry, together with additional government ministries and other supporters. And this afternoon, 25 years later, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure are still demonstrating that leadership, that innovation, and that investment in injury prevention. For that, we thank you. And as much as the unit has been recognized, again, for which we thank you all, there's been a, a constant theme that I'm sure is not lost on anybody, that this work only gets done through the many, many collaborations and partnerships from many different disciplines, from many different sectors. And I think that if we've learned something as a unit addressing injury prevention, it's about how to recognize who can help us, go out and court that person like crazy or that group and bring them to an understanding of the role they can play to help us work to make this province a better place by reducing the human toll that injury takes. So from all of us at the unit, thank you again for attending and celebrating our 25th anniversary with us. We're so pleased and proud to work with all of you. Thank you so very much and safe journeys home. Ooh. I'm sorry, all of the presenters the, who's, who spoke this afternoon, Johnston is our communications man. We would like a group photograph. Is it better outside by the colored window, Johnston? Yeah, if, if everybody who was 
uh, at the mic this afternoon and presenting. If you wouldn't mind, just out in the lobby to the left are a set of colored windows that make a nice backdrop. Thank you. <laughs> 